Good afternoon, everybody. Hope you had a great weekend, especially Saturday. That was nice. Here with uh, Josh and Paul, of course, and Pastor Montz from the uh, Citadel of Love uh, in North Hartford. Um, he was going to talk for a few minutes. Um, you know, COVID is not the only thing that's stealing lives. Uh, so is gun violence and what that means to our community. And Pastor Montz can talk a little bit about what he's hearing here in Hartford and what he's saying. Uh, let me tell you first about our COVID daily summary going back three days for Friday. Uh, what I think you see here is our numbers have stabilized, and uh, I think that's, um, that's better than uh, some of the alternatives. 3% positivity rate, hospitalizations down a little bit over the last three days. Fatalities up, that's a three-day number. Uh, overall, our um, positivity rate is uh, a little bit lower than it's been over the last few weeks. Um, I think we're making progress. Um, that said, look around the rest of the uh, world. You can see uh, Europe is flaring up in lockdown. India is flaring up in lockdown. Brazil is flaring up in lockdown. Um, Idaho and Michigan here, uh, slightly closer to home um, in uh, surely Michigan, uh, locking down. So uh, we take nothing for granted. But I think we continue to make good progress uh, here in our region, and particularly here in the state of Connecticut, in part because of the vaccine. And we're having good progress in the vaccine. Look, we finally have a majority of the people of Connecticut, the adults, have been vaccinated. 52% of adults, 16 and above, have received the vaccine. I'm particularly impressed that 83% of those 65 and above have now been vaccinated, have had their first dose. 83%. You maybe remember going back a few months, so I don't know, 50% are vaccine hesitant, 50% may not get vaccinated, what are we going to do? I'd hope that uh, 65 and above are canary in a coal mine, and you see that that's 83%, 71% of uh, 55 to 64. I'd like to think those numbers continue to go up as we move towards uh, really herd immunity. Uh, 16 to 44, that's 30 percent. That's up from 20 percent just a few days ago. Very important that young people continue to get vaccinated as, as they've been doing. That's really what's going to protect us from um, what you see going on in some of these other countries and regions of the, of the country. Um, we expect from Pfizer in particular uh, eligibility for vaccinations to open up. Right now, they're the only ones to do 16 to 18. Everybody does 18 and above. It looks like Pfizer is going to get a green light in the next month or so uh, for a younger demo, 12 to 15. That's really important because it's the younger demographic. We're not suffering many complications, but suffering uh, a lot of infections. So really urging them to get vaccinated and really hopeful that the younger age group, 12 to um, 16, will be able to uh, be vaccinated and vaccinated soon. The only worry I see in these numbers is um, J&J. &J. They hit a speed bump at their Maryland manufacturing facility. Uh, we're receiving less vaccinations this week uh, than we did uh, last week, gone from about 288,000 last week to about 180,000 or so this week. That shortfall is really all related to Johnson & Johnson. Um, and I'm afraid we don't have uh, any clarity on what we can expect uh, next week, but we'll be ramping up again, but perhaps slowly. Uh, that said, more positive, there are vaccine appointments available. Uh, probably in the morning is the best time to try. Uh, every day we get new vaccines available, not as many as we had the week before, but still tens of thousands. And those are tens of thousands of appointments opening up every day. You could have found appointments uh, this morning for later today. I haven't been able to say that in some months. You go to ct.gov, COVID vaccine, or dial the telephone, 877-918-2224. Uh, and do us a favor. Uh, let's say you were there refreshing. You couldn't get your vaccine appointment for two weeks. Then you checked and you got a vaccine appointment for tomorrow. Please cancel the other vaccine appointment. Makes our lives a lot easier and makes one more person eligible a little bit sooner. Next up is... Um, from our friend Red Gidi, who was, uh, you know, co-chairman with Deidre of our vaccination um, advisory group, head of Trinity Health. They did a vaxathon. They did it here in uh, Hartford. Sort of everybody's trying different ways to get your attention, get you there. This vaxathon 
was 24 hours, round the clock, uh, led by 300 volunteers who uh, made an enormous effort. There at the um, 4,000 people got vaccinated over the course of that 24-hour period, over half of them uh, people of color, for which we're um, you know, very thankful. So uh, to Reg and the Trinity Health team, um, well done. We continue to do everything we can to bring vaccines to the people, make it easier for you to get vaccinated, um, no questions asked, free of charge, and increasingly you don't need an appointment, just uh, come and get vaccinated. You can see that FEMA mobile unit, the one that vaccinated thousands of people in Bridgeport, is now moving on to New Britain, North Canaan, Winstead, and Hartford. Uh, you can see uh, then the Griffin mobile vans, which are the smaller ones, a little like the ice cream truck in yellow down there. You see where they're going. You know, sort of easy. Just uh, go to the mayor's website, go to the East Hartford um, Facebook page. You'll be able to find, uh, you know, when the uh, van's going to be there. And um, also, as you know, we've had hundreds of people knocking on doors, making telephone calls this weekend, last week, going forward. They'll be doing that in New Haven and Waterbury and Hartford and Hamden. Just reminding you, the van is going to be there. Um, if you're in Winstead, by the way, um, and you get that shot, you may go to the American Mural Project. I was there this weekend. It's quite remarkable. Celebrates people who do the work in our country. All right, so encouraging people to get vaccinated. Um, I think this is important. Uh, there's a lot of noise about Big Brother and vaccinations. You have no right to ask me and the such. I'm finding as I look around at the state and our country and even internationally, people are doing everything we can to encourage you and incent you to get vaccinated and give you the right to us, you know, make sure you're there with other people who have been vaccinated. So a couple of little headlines that uh, Josh found I thought were nice. Uh, shot for a shot. New Orleans Bar. You get a vaccine shot, you'll get a free shot of alcohol. Come on in. Uh, free with your COVID shot. You get a beer, arcade tokens, Krispy Kreme donuts. Remember, you get a donut a day uh, as, um, as long as it lasts uh, if you've gotten uh, vaccinated. So maybe we should move those mobile vans up to the uh, Krispy Kreme locations. You can get a, get a twofer while you're there. Major League Baseball pushes incentives to encourage all their players to get vaccinated. I was interested. Um, you can uh, now play cards. You can do a little poker uh, even without the mask. Sit in a group if you've been vaccinated. Otherwise, uh, you're going to have to just listen to your iPhone. The Miami Heat, sort of interesting, uh, down in Florida. I didn't know the governor uh, liked this, but they've got a special VIP section for Miami Heat basketball fans. VIP standing for Vaccinated Important People. And there, there's sort of uh, courtside seats, preferred seating, um, and you know you're sitting next to somebody else who's been vaccinated. Movie theaters, free popcorn. We're doing everything we can to encourage you to do the right thing for you in your community. And finally, I'll just uh, take this before I um, pass the baton. That's We're making good progress in terms of our proms, graduations, parks, beaches, uh, in terms of proms and graduations, a lot of questions, a lot of planning going on. I think you should be able to count on it. We're going to be able to get this done. I would uh, urge the later you can uh, book it, the better. Just give you a little more flexibility in case um, something untoward happens. I think we'll be in pretty good shape. The later you do it, the warmer it is, the more likely it is you'll be able to um, have that graduation or prom outside. The later you do it, the higher the vaccination rates we have. What a difference that's going to make. And uh, I was, um, you know, in Bark Hempstead at uh, one of their beautiful parks, the People's Park, uh, on Friday with Katie Dykes. I was amazed. We kept our parks and our beaches open um, all during 2020 and, and now. They're open at full capacity now. Last year, they're open at partial capacity just because we didn't want things to get too crowded. And it was the busiest year in our history for our parks and beaches. People really love uh, if, you, if you're going to suffer through COVID, being in a state like Connecticut where you can get outside a little fresh air is a really important thing. But that said, let me pass the baton over to Pastor Motts. Um, it was a tough weekend, a really tough weekend, a weekend with a two needless gun-related fatalities, a 3-year-old and a 16-year-old. 
And uh, Pastor Motz uh, is on the front lines when it comes to, um, you know, talking to young people, talking to their parents, COVID and violence. Pastor Motz, thank you for being here with us. Thank you for having me, Governor. I uh, do want to just say thank you so much for uh, your leadership to our state, especially during the last year. We really do appreciate you. Um, I am challenged, however, uh, after talking with so many people about what happened on Saturday. And first, let me say uh, and give my condolences to the family of Rondell Jones and the family of Jamari Preston. Um, very senseless, senseless killings, unnecessary. Um, beautiful children with a great future in front of them. Um, dreams. Their families had dreams for them. And to have something like this happen is just devastating. Um, my mother was, you know, impacted by this. I have a three-year-old granddaughter. Um, and so this just sort of shook me in a different way. And I really feel what is going on right now, Governor, is that we're fighting uh, a spirit of fear. Um, the vaccine has gotten people afraid. Uh, the virus has gotten people afraid. And now there are people who are afraid for their own vitality. And um, one of my favorite Bible verses says, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. And I am praying and I am hoping that we as a community would come together in the power of love um, to heal, um, to bring strength, and ultimately to bring victory to our entire community. Um, but we have got to come to some kind of way where we look at our hearts and we see, is this the Hartford we want? Is this the Connecticut we want? Is this the world we want where our children are being killed? It's one thing when people can make decisions to do certain things, but a three-year-old, I mean, come on. We, we've got to fix this and we've got to fix it fast. We've got to get love in our homes. We've got to get love in our community. We've got to love one another. And that starts with, I believe, with forgiveness. Uh, let's stop placing blame on other people and let's just forgive and move forward into how we're going to make our community better. Um, I'm so happy to hear about the, the, uh, the, vax the vaxathon that happened this past weekend, um, to hear so many people got vaccinated. We can't walk in fear. When I was a kid, I couldn't go to school if I didn't get vaccinated, you know? Um, it, let's, let's be safe. Let's care about each other. Let's love each other. Um, and then let's make Hartford and let's make Connecticut better. I believe this is, Hartford is not just the city of God, but Connecticut is the state of God. This is where God reigns. I know they call us the chosen frozen, uh, but we know this is where the spirit of God is. Uh, but we need to love each other and we've got to come together and figure out how to do this. We got to care about each other. We got to love each other. As you say, pastor, we, um, remember Randall member, uh, Jamari, um, our hearts go out to their parents and their friends. Um, pastor Mont also is a pastor to the, uh, police chaplain. He knows how people are grieving across this city in this state. Absolutely. Uh, with that, can I take this can I very quickly? Please. The police are going through too. You know, I've spoken with them as well. They're challenged because they want to do the very best job that they can. Every single police officer that I've talked to says, I took this job to help people. And they feel they're feeling like their hands are tied. Uh, it's just been such a crazy time to go from eight murders in all of 2020 and now eight so far in 2021. My mother said something. She said, I almost wish we were on lockdown again. Uh, and I know nobody wants that, but we have got to figure out we cannot have our police stressed and traumatized while we're stressed and traumatized. And then health workers are stressed and traumatized. We got to take a break. We got to take a breather. And we got to work hard to come together and help each other. Yeah, as you say, um, Caring and love for one another, that's the uh, vaccine to prevent gun violence as well. Yes. Any questions? Josh and Paula here as well. News 8. Good afternoon, everyone. Good. You talked again about um, 
the amount of J and J and how much less than we had been getting because of that. And again, you mentioned the um, the vans going out. Will, will you make them exclusively? Is that the one place that Johnson and Johnson, because there's so few now, is that the one place you'll bring him in, in, in those vans to get to those areas? Yeah, Josh tells me we prioritize every uh, J and J we have to those mobile vans. Is that exclusive right now, Josh? There's a couple other very small areas where where it's needed, but the vast majority of the Johnson Johnson we have is going into the mobile units, and for now at least, we think we're able to continue to fully supply them. And Governor, with respect to uh, you mentioned again graduations and proms, and that you remain confident that those will happen. Uh, you know, as far as it being later than or as late as possible, obviously there's there's a certain time frame that are under there. What else can you say about both the graduations and uh, proms at, at this time? Uh, I can tell you that um, it's uh, warmer and you're more likely to be vaccinated in June than you are in May. Uh, I can tell you that I feel very confident that your um, your prom and your graduation is going to take place, uh, hopefully uh, outside. And um, and get vaccinated. Then everybody around you can be as safe as you are. Channel three eyewitness news. Uh, yes, Governor, kind of following up on that question, you know, as the variants spread, especially among younger people, what measures are in place right now to track this in the schools, especially as you know, the prom and the graduation guidance was released today? I can tell you, as we look around um, the rest of the country, uh, you're right, Matt, we've seen um, school-related sports um, have been a source of some flare-ups. Uh, we've had some teams that have had to quarantine. Generally, the schools sort of reflect the community spread um, you know, more broadly. We have not seen as much of that here in Connecticut, and that's one of the reasons um, – uh, we are beginning to emphasize the 16 to 18 year old and then even the 12 to 15. If we can get them vaccinated sooner rather than later, that's a big plus. But right now, our schools are able to operate and operate safely, for which I'm very thankful. And, and a kind of quick question on the Naugatuck Valley, because that was the source of a, a hot spot last week. Um, has a potential source for those clusters of cases been identified, especially you know, since the Waterbury Health Department says that there has been a significant rise in cases in those 18 and younger. Um, I don't think Track and Trace has identified any one um, particular thing. I think it's more of those informal socializations, maybe a little less likely to wear the mask, maybe a little less likely to get the vaccines, but um, I don't think there's anything particular. Is there, Josh, that we point to? No, I think that sums it up well, Governor. Thank you. NBC Connecticut. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Governor, sticking with the prom and graduation, has there been any changes or expected changes to the number of people that would be allowed outdoors, um, mandating testing, anything like that? Uh, no changes at this point, but uh, I think outdoors you're going to have a, a fair amount of capacity there so those proms and graduations can go forward as planned. And is it still expected that at the end of April, the state will start seeing a vaccine surplus, or has that now changed due to J&J? &J? Well, you can see we have a little more room right now. As I said, you could have gone on a first thing this morning, and there were at least a few spots open for uh, later today. So I think uh, we're getting closer to a balance. Uh, I'd like to get those J&J &J vaccines uh, back in force, but that may be another 10 days. And lastly, are you continuing to notice hesitancy for some to get the vaccine? And how significant of a hurdle do you see that to get herd immunity? How concerning is it for you? A, I'll start by the fact that I'm encouraged that you have over 80 percent of the folks, uh, you know, 65 and above, uh, 70 above. That's a good deal compared to where we thought we might be a few months ago. Uh, you know, I worry that right now the um, infection rate is highest among the younger folks, especially 20 to 30 years old, the so-called invincibles. Um, so you can see we've made a particular effort to make sure they know how important it is to get vaccinated. So far, they're getting vaccinated. Keep going, guys. Thank you. Fox 61. 
Hello, Governor. Quick question for you on the LEAP program that you announced today. What problems are we seeing with students in Connecticut when it comes to this absenteeism? And what are we hoping that this program will achieve? Yeah, the LEAP program is uh, really important. Look, we, just same way we found that um, we, we're knocking on doors to tell people how important it is to get vaccinated. You can't do everything, all, you know, online. The LEAP program, we're going to have um, hundreds and hundreds of folks, as well as teachers and school officials, calling, knocking on doors, telling those students, probably 25 percent of whom have never been back in the classroom over the last uh, nine months, even though the overwhelming majority of our schools are open for uh, in-person learning. Most of them, almost all of them, for um, full time, at least 75 percent. So you got two months less left. So the um, lead program is knocking on doors, telling you we want you back in the school. You can do it safely. And by the way, here's some programs we're going to have this summer, starting with a summer camp that I know you'll be able to afford. Thank you. My second question is for the pastor. What can we do or what can we ask our community to do to try to curb this violence when we see something like this with these two young lives lost? What is the challenge that people need to meet in order to stop this from happening in the future? Okay, thank you. I'm not sure that we can stop it from happening, but I know we can start by talking. Um, we have to make people know that it is important if you know something you talk about it, you tell someone about it. In addition to that, I believe that we have to return to a kind of civil community where we care about one another and not think the worst of one another. Um, so it, it starts, I feel, however, in the home. And uh, when we can start to get our homes with more love and more compassion, and I think that's going to spill over into the streets. But it starts with us talking. We've got to talk. If we know something, we got to say it. News 12, Connecticut. Good afternoon. A lot of excitement about the potential proms. I'm wondering, why was this something that's important? And how do you think these will look and be different than your traditional proms? Hey, Josh or Paul, do you want to try that? Well, our, our uh, Department of Public Health, uh, in collaboration with the State uh, uh, Department of Education, put out guidance last week because they've been getting a lot of questions from districts and from parents and families. So uh, we appreciate the efforts they put into those guidance. And, and it will look different. You know, I think as the governor indicated, you know, they'll probably be smaller, much more likely to be outdoors, probably won't run as long, maybe not as... Uh, not as many people jammed into indoor spaces, but still uh, we're very hopeful uh, and excited that there will be the opportunity for something more traditional uh, in terms of proms and graduations, these really important life milestones uh, for, for high school students in particular, um, you know, that we weren't able to enjoy uh, or anywhere near the same degree last year. So this is just, you know, one, one more step, hopefully back towards normal. But as the governor said, you know, message to high school students out there is, is you've got hopefully a few weeks before your prom to go get vaccinated. That will definitely help reduce the risk. So please, uh, you know, get an appointment, go get vaccinated. Do you see some good economic impact coming out of this for, you know, vendors in the event sector? Well, look, every, every event helps, right? Um, there's, a, there's a long way to go for a lot of those, um, you know, event venues and restaurants and others who were hit so hard last year, but we're really hopeful and optimistic that as we get into late spring and summer, um, you know, they're really going to be able to uh, start to recover a lot of the, the lost business that, that they've had to endure over the last year. And I'm going to ask a question from one of my associates about uh, what criteria would be used to send refugee kids from former juvenile detention, from former juvenile detention centers in Connecticut? Um, the criteria for kids coming up from the border to, um, for example, our juvenile um, training facility, is that what you're asking, Suzanne? Yes, thank you. Yeah. Um, look, as you know, uh, the White House has asked virtually every state in the country. They're recommending a location. So they'd like something that was uh, 
you know, relatively secure, but uh, just importantly, a place of caring and hope for these kids where they can feel uh, safe and uh, maybe have some outdoors activity, maybe some educational opportunities. So um, uh, that's how we prioritize uh, probably a recommendation we're going to make to the White House in the next uh, couple of days. Yeah, Paul? I'll add, Governor, um, it's not only about identifying a potential location uh, to support during this humanitarian crisis, it's also ensuring that uh, the location has the right people and the right services uh, to serve uh, uh, these children who are now in our in our country, and in this case, will be in our. We lost you, Paul. Unmute, Paul. Unmute. Unmute. Sorry about that, Governor. Uh, I'll start over. Uh, yes, the, the governor has uh, uh, basically put forth a team internally, led by myself uh, and. Uh, Commissioner of Department of Children and Family, uh, Vanessa Durantes. It's not only about uh, identifying a location uh, to support during this humanitarian crisis. It's also about ensuring that you have the right people who are providing uh, the services and have the right services, the, the extreme wraparound services that are needed uh, for uh, these children who are now not only in our country, but also would be in our state. Uh, we have not provided uh, a final recommendation to the White House, uh, but we are in the process of uh, completing our due diligence process at this time. Thanks, gentlemen. I should add that um, whatever happens uh, is 100% paid for by the federal government. The Associated Press. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, Governor, if we get back to the LEAP program for a second, you announced the $10.7 million today, but the uh, congressional delegation also said that uh, money from the American Rescue Plan will be coming for uh, some more education dollars. Can you um, quantify how much money and when and what that money will be used to for in addition to the money that you announced for LEAP? Yeah, we're going to get... $1.1 billion over the next two years. And um, that money, uh, some of it goes through uh, the state government here in Hartford. Some of that money goes directly to our superintendents and to our schools. I think priority number one um, is guidance is uh, learning loss. How do we get these kids back up to speed? So as I've said before, um, that doesn't start in September. That starts in uh, early July. And uh, Charlene, our... Uh, Commissioner of Education, working very hard with superintendents and the not-for-profit community, trying to put together programs that we can, um, you know, make available to superintendents so those kids can hit the ground running in July. Uh, not all STEM learning, but also some fun and a chance to socialize and to be with their peers so that they're ready to learn in September. Do you have any details on those camps and those those programs? You have mentioned aquariums. You have mentioned uh, other places kids can, can visit. Do, who's running the camps, and are those details still being worked out, or do you have do you have some details on that? Yeah, give us another uh, week on that, if you could. We're, um, we're working with the camps. We're working with the museums. We're working with the libraries. We're working with the uh, aquariums, trying to put together a package that I hope a lot of our superintendents are going to say this is a good way to go. And finally, um, vaccine passports. Has there been any more talk about uh, creating something for Connecticut and how people are going to prove they've been vaccinated when they go to a concert or go to some other uh, event? Yeah, right now you can go to VAMS. You can get um, proof. You can get that laminated. You can do that yourself. Um, whether we as the state want to step in and do that like they are in New York, I, I don't think we've taken that step as yet. Uh, but as I've said before, and I alluded to during the uh, you know, briefing, um, we've got a number of businesses who are being very creative about how, um, you know, if you can show you've been vaccinated, you're in the easy pass line. You're in, a, you're in a faster line. Other people have to show, you know, proof of testing and things like that. Thank you, Governor. Appreciate it. Thank you. The Hartford Current. Hi. Um, first of all, Governor, I'm just wondering if there is anything policy-wise out of your office or out of the legislature that you think can be done um, in Hartford to address um, the type of violence that, that we're seeing. Um, right now, we're not looking at a legislative response to this. Um, I think you heard from the pastor. We're working with the um, uh, 
the religious community. We're working with families. We're working with uh, Project Longevity. We're working with the community groups, doing everything we can to, A, uh, reduce the tension and the risk out there. There's not a big spike in, in violence necessarily around the uh, state or around the country, but it's something we take very seriously. I know what it means to a community. On, a, on another subject, um, we understand that the uh, percentage of vaccine doses that have gone toward high SVI zip codes actually decreased this past week. Um, why did that happen, and what is being done to ensure that won't happen again? Is that true, Josh? Yeah, and I think it, it had a lot to do with, with two factors. One, last week was, as we previously discussed, an all-time record by far in terms of the number of vaccines we received in Connecticut. And a lot of our providers who are focused um, you know, on our high SVI communities were maxed out, and we were able to give additional vaccine to some of the local health districts in particular um, in some of the suburban communities or non-high SVI communities. So um, that local health department category was the one that declined the most and really led that decline week over week. And I think it may have also had to do with the fact the last measurement week straddled when we opened up to 16 and above. Um, so there were a couple factors there. But as the governor described during the presentation, you know, we're, we're really proud of a lot of the work that's going on around the state and in our cities in particular to make uh, it as easy as possible for people to get vaccinated, bring vaccine opportunities directly to them. Uh, we're seeing more and more opportunities for walk-up appointments, really trying to tear down every barrier that we can identify to, to help people get vaccinated uh, as quickly as possible. So I know that the SVI targets are not a requirement. Um, there's not really any enforcement behind it, but is there any consequence for different parts of the uh, formula that fail to meet those uh, targets? Or, or what, what can be done to further incentivize or further motivate or further require um, those targets to be hit? Well, as, as you probably know, Alex, the, the category which has been consistently lowest in terms of vaccinating people in the high SBI communities has been um, the pharmacies. And we have been talking to uh, our federal partners uh, about additional things we can do there. Those, out, those doses are allocated directly through the federal pharmacy program. So we're hoping those conversations can proceed well. We do think we're right on the, on the edge, though, of, as the governor mentioned, as, as demand starts to taper off a little bit, you know, it, when it becomes easier for people to get walk-up appointments in the pharmacies in particular, a lot of the pharmacies that are providing vaccine are located in our high SVI communities. The problem has been is that uh, people who live in those communities often aren't the ones who are first able to get to those appointments in the pharmacies. So we're hopeful that dynamic will turn. That will help a lot. Um, but, you know, again, we'll, we're going to continue to push every avenue. Um, you know, we're going to be in a position again in a week or two here where, you know, there's going to be more vaccine available than, than providers, um, you know, have the demand for it. We're already seeing some local health departments start to phase out their vaccination programs. Um, so, you know, we're going to keep pushing every angle we can. And then lastly, uh, what happens if in a future week there isn't enough Johnson & Johnson to distribute to these mobile vans? Um, is there kind of a contingent, contingency plan, or would you have to pull some of those vans off of the road for a time? No, we're going to, we want to do everything we can to keep them out on the road. The, the contingency plans that we're working on have to do with them uh, starting to do mRNA vaccines. So doing the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine, which obviously adds complexity to coordinate that follow-up, the second dose of appointment, but uh, our providers are, are working on how those plans would, uh, would evolve. Got it. Thanks, Josh. Hearst, Connecticut Media. Thanks. Uh, Governor Julia Bergman from Hearst. Um, in regard to the tragedies in Hartford over the weekend, you'd indicated at the outset that um, gun violence like the coronavirus pandemic are both public health crises. So would you consider, have you given any thought to um, directing some of the stimulus money to gun uh, violence prevention programs? Oh, that's a very interesting idea, Julia. Um, um, I, we, we did previously, because of uh, the nature of uh, the demand with uh, everybody quarantined and what that meant in terms of uh, some spikes in violence going back a few months, and uh, we're ready to do that again as needed. Yeah, as the governor stated, uh, over the summer, uh, the, the governor directed uh, federal funds that came to the state uh, to cities such as Hartford, New Haven, New Waterbury, and Bridgeport uh, for various means, whether it was to support additional uh, police support in, in overtime or in the governor's, as, as stated, as well as for violence reduction programs within those particular cities. 
Uh, as we get more information on the federal guidelines, we will continuously look at various ways uh, to utilize federal funds to support our state in all various manner. Thanks. And then I guess for Josh, what is the um, current total supply of the J&J &J vaccine in Connecticut? And are there any firmer plans for the colleges? I know there was discussion of at least getting their first dose before they leave for the summer. Sure. So across all of the channels through which vaccine comes into Connecticut, our state allocation, the federal pharmacy program, and the federally qualified health centers that get direct allocation from the federal government, we're getting about 21,000 doses of Johnson & Johnson into the state this coming week. We don't yet have visibility into what we should expect for next week. Um, and with regards to the colleges, yes, we, we are working. The governor has been in discussions with, with the White House and with fellow governors. Um, our plan there does have to shift. Uh, we had hoped to vaccinate them with Johnson & Johnson. Um, we're now going to pivot to uh, uh, providing them with either Pfizer or Moderna um, and uh, uh, make sure that as uh, college students return from other states, we have opportunities available for them for their second dose appointments, even if that does cross state lines. And we think that should be relatively easy to execute, particularly in you know mid to late May. I think all 50 states will have uh, plenty of vaccine available at that time. And is there any travel guidance that might be expected for the college students, um, especially you know if there's gonna be a lot of people flying or things like that? Is it similar to what we've seen with sort of testing before they go and testing negative before they go? Yeah, well, as, as uh, you know, Governor mentioned several weeks ago, the, the travel um, uh, advisory is, is guidance at this point. So that is best practices is to, to, to te get tested before you travel, get tested when you get back. But primarily the goal is here to get vaccinated. Um, that, that helps uh, alleviate a lot of the risk. And that's why we're focused on trying to get college students vaccinated in as high numbers as possible while they're still living in their dorms. It's really easy to bring the vaccine directly to them. The Waterbury Republican American. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, Josh, I, would, I had a couple of screens open and I can't seem to find it now. What, what, are the, what was the uh, performance in terms of the S SBI? I thought I saw something somewhere maybe 28 percent, but maybe you could uh, give us what the goal was and, and what we uh, achieved. Last week was, was 22 percent, Paul. 22 percent. Okay. Sorry. Out of uh, 31? 30. Yeah. Okay. And what, what is the mix of, of vaccines that we're expecting this week, the, num the total doses and, and the mix? You said, I think, 21,000 from J&J? &J? Yep, 98,000 Pfizer and 60,000 Moderna. Okay. Um, and uh, Governor, or, or maybe Paul might, or, or Josh might know the answer to this. Um, I was forwarded an email from a, uh, an advocacy group that is under the impression that the telehealth order uh, will expire on April 20th, but I thought that was part of the legislative package that was uh, approved going to May 20th. So what, what's the status of the governor's order on, on telehealth coverage? I'll start. I want to keep telehealth. I want to make it permanent in the state, work with the legislature on that, but at a minimum, it's going to go through May 20th. Okay. Um, and where do things stand with the discussions with the legislature? I know there's there's bills moving through. I mean, wh where do we stand on that issue? Well, I agree. In terms of, yeah, in terms of telehealth, as the governor said, we're, there's a commitment that the, the as the legis as um, the administration, we will ex make sure it's expanded to to May 20th. When it comes to the legislature, obviously they have to uh, take up a full bill um, on their calendars that will pass both the House and the Senate. But as the governor stated, he wants to make it permanent, so we look forward to a bill get to his desk. Well, I, I, I guess I'm, I'm trying to get a sense of what the negotiations, because this is this seems to be one of those issues where there is is bipartisan and uh, bi governmental branch support for 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 the proposal. Correct. It's like a matter I mean, of working out the details. I'll, I'll go even further. There's really there's really no negotiation because the, the governor is ready for the bill to get to his desk. Okay. Thanks a lot. The day of New London. Hi, everyone. This is Sten Spinella with the day. Uh, Governor, I wanted to ask about one part of the LEAP program. Um, as you said, it will increase staffing uh, to deploy people to homes of chronically absent or disengaged students and work with their families. I'm wondering who exactly uh, will be employing the staff to work on this retention. Will it be local districts? 
Uh, will the staff include educators working for school districts? Um, what we've got is a contract with a group that's going to work with uh, six major uh, out groups that will do the door-to-door -door and the knocking. We're going to be talking to the Boys and Girls Club, talking to the YMCAs, and getting other not-for-profits involved as well. So will any, um, you know, educators involved in school districts be a part of that workforce as well as the um, people you just mentioned? I don't think so, uh, Stan. I, I think um, they're going to go out and find others who are going to knock on the doors, but it's closely coordinated with the educators, that's for sure. All right, thank you. CT News Junkie. Thanks, Max. Uh, this is similar to what you guys have been talking about, but I understand that the chief medical examiner's office is reporting that there was like a 30% spike in homicides in the state over the year before. Um, that seems like a lot. Do we know what may be driving this and what the state can do about it? Paul, I haven't heard that number. I, I haven't heard that number, but I'll be happy to check on that and get back to you. Okay. Um, I was also wondering, we were talking, or the governor, you were talking earlier about uh, vaccinating children under between like 12 and 15 years old. Uh, I guess pediatricians have, are saying that they're kind of in the dark about it. Do we have a plan for how we're going to vaccinate those kids when something's approved for them? Well, I think it's a little premature, Hugh, just because... Um... FDA has still got to approve. Uh, you know, rumor has it, rumor has it, that it'll probably be in the next uh, month or so with some guidance uh, from CDC on how that's done with parental permission. Okay. Thank you. The Connecticut Mirror. Hey, everyone. Um, you guys recently launched a program designed to help folks in nursing homes get second doses or for new residents or new workers get a first dose or a single dose. Um, a lot of that effort, both at the catch-up clinics and uh, the discharges from hospitals to nursing homes, involves a supply of Johnson & Johnson. Do you anticipate having to reduce those clinics, those catch-up clinics, or that effort in any way with the reduced J&J &J supply? Uh Hey, Jenna, we, do, we don't anticipate having to slow that down. Um, as I mentioned in my answer to the prior question that there were a few other small uses of J&J, &J, this is one of them, um, where some of our hospitals who are uh, providing Johnson Johnson vaccination on discharge into a nursing home, um, there will be some cases where that will continue. Um, and where it doesn't, um, we're making plans with all of the involved uh, providers to ensure that there's adequate uh, Pfizer or Moderna available, and then coordinating the second dose appointment as well. So that, that work is critically important to make sure that we stay on top of the very high vaccination rates we have in our nursing homes and not see that slip. Um, and, you know, compliments to the team at Department of Public Health, the industry, and our pharmacy partners who are doing a great job there. Okay, thanks. And then, Governor, the Vaccine Advisory Panel and its subcommittees haven't met in quite a while. How do you view the group's role currently? Do you consider their work to be concluded, or do you have them on standby in case you would need a recommendation for something in the future? How do you see their role? I think they're definitely on standby. I think Deirdre and uh, Reg uh, talked to them um, along the way. My instinct is that over the course of the next couple of months, if we find out about vaccines for younger people, if we find out about booster shots, depending on what the variants are, uh, that group could be uh, quite busy again. Thank you. Connecticut Public Media. Good afternoon. Uh, when does the state think health providers and centers should considering rolling back their testing services? And does the state have any specific uh, metric or data that they're going to use to start to roll back some of the testing. What that, Josh? Sure. Um, well, we're, we're going to likely need to continue doing quite a bit of testing for the foreseeable future. I mean, we passed a big milestone today with more than half of the state uh, having received their first 
dose of MR, you know, of a vaccine of half of the adult population receiving their first dose, but almost half still have not received their first dose. So there's still a lot of unvaccinated people in the state, particularly younger people. That's where we're seeing a lot of cases right now. Um, and so we need to continue testing for, for a while longer. Um, you know, we'll continue to monitor it carefully. We'll continue to look for recommendations uh, from Commissioner Gifford and her team about different populations we may be able to scale back. Um, but unfortunately, we'll probably be uh, continuing to test for, for some time longer, and, and we appreciate our providers who've continued to support that effort for, you know, over a year now. Do you know uh, what the testing numbers look like are they compare, as they compare to the fall and winter months and now? Yeah, you know, they've been, they've been quite steady, actually. I mean, we've had 243,000 tests done over the last week, um, and that's kind of in the midpoint of where we've been for the last, you know, really since the end of the, end of the summer um, for months now. So the volumes have been pretty steady. I think you've seen a mix to some degree. Um, you know, we have a lot of hospitals are kind of testing everybody that's coming in or out of the hospital for procedure. Um, you know, it's maybe dropped off in some other areas, but the volumes overall still give us a very good pulse of, of the activity across the state, still among the highest in the nation. And last question, I guess like in a perfect world, when do you think testing would more closely look like we have for the flu, which is primarily done at doctor's offices or urgent cares? Well, there's already a, a lot of uh, point of care testing going on right now with antigen tests, um, both, uh, you know, in, in medical facilities and nursing homes and other places. Um, so, and we're seeing a lot of additional testing continue, uh, uh, testing innovation continue. You're going to see relatively affordable at-home tests. You know, there's a bunch of them that are queued up for approval by the FDA right now. So I think it will evolve, uh, you know, kind of away from, you know, the drive-through mass testing sites that we've relied on so much over the last year to a much more convenient kind of at-home or, or with your, you know, at point of care uh, tests becoming much more widely available. Thank you. All right, Max has given me the signal. Um, let me just say I really appreciate this past weekend. The uh, hundreds of people are out there knocking on doors, uh, telling people how important it is uh, that you get vaccinated. I appreciate the number of people, especially young people, who are out there uh, getting vaccinated. And as uh, Pastor Monst reminds us, there's not necessarily any vaccine for uh, violence uh, except for love and caring. Appreciate you, Pastor, uh, sharing your words. Look forward to seeing you soon. Thanks, everybody.